Well, well, I could, but I won't go on with such letters. Uh, but about 10% of them have a really special interest or quality about them. And there are other strange happenings, like long distance phone calls late at night from some student who wants me to solve a problem for him. And I say, it's two in the morning. He says, oh, I'm from Los Angeles. It's only 11 o'clock here. Uh, and I say, why don't you ask your professor? He says, oh, I would never go to him. Uh, and it pro probably has an exam the next day. Well, what are you going to do? I mean, uh, so I groggy. I go get the book, and I say, OK, which problem? And, and we go over it, and he's right. And I say, you're right. You didn't make any mistakes. He says, but look at the back of the book. I said, oh my god, the answer's wrong back there. He said, yep, the answer was wrong back there. And what I realized, uh, maybe at that time or a little later, is that uh, once our book was to be published, uh, we hired two really outstanding graduate students who both got their PhDs quickly and went on to, well, they'd be embarrassed if I mentioned their names and said, look, you guys, I want you each to solve these problems. If, if you agree, fine. If you disagree, argue about it. If you still disagree, come and see me. Well, they never came to see me. And what I learned is that one guy took volume one, the other guy took volume two, and they never <laughs> talked to each other. And they made about 25% mistakes, you know, sometimes numerical, but those problems were not easy. In any case, that's the way I, I heard it. Well, I should say that, uh, lest I give you the wrong impression, many letters and calls are complimentary, and a fair number of them, uh, if not directly, at least indirectly, teach me something about physics or how to teach it. Uh, in fact, these letters and happenings helped the publisher at a time of frustration. In 1970, when the sales had passed the million mark, uh, the Wiley editorial group sought to get a thoughtful article published in a trade journal about the success of this book, which I said was unusual for a physics text. Uh, they wanted to report on it in a professional way, but they were turned down everywhere. Uh, but one day, my wife got a call uh, from a third cousin of hers who had recently returned from a European assignment for a time in Life magazine as a correspondent, and he was now writing for the New York Times on literary and intellectual affairs mostly. Israel Schenker, maybe you remember that name. Uh, he said he was coming up to Bennington College, which was near us, to interview Bernard Malamed, who was in residence there, but he'd stop by to see us. So he did, and uh, I took him over to my office, and I showed him uh, some of these letters I got. Uh, at first, I was talking about uh, what was happening at the Commission on College Physics uh, and how the, an anti-science trend was building up at the time. And so he went down to New York, I guess, and then he called me back. He said, Bob, the publisher says this is great. He wants to run this story. But one thing he wants to know, how much money are you making? So I said, forget the story. He said, you can't do that to me. I said, you know, it's nobody's business. He says, but the editor's right. The public wants to know. I said, well, how about this? I live on a block of dentists and physicians, and they're all called doctor. And I have a PhD, and I'm called mister. Uh, I said, this book has finally brought my income up to the average doctor on the block. He said, fine, I'll use that. And that's what he did. So that was a way. You see, they don't believe academics should make any money. It's somehow, that's unfair. <laughs> OK. In any case, in August 1971, there was a story entitled, The Great Eggplant Grows Into a Popular Academic Success in the New York Times, taking a half a page in the front of the second section, better and more public than the firm could have hoped for. It even made the international edition of the Herald Tribune, and I heard from my friends in Europe at the time, under the title, The Colors of Physics. Let's see, the next two slides will show that, and I guess we'll have to get a light out again. Uh, Here's the article. Can you see that? The great eggplant 
what's it called now? The great eggplant grows into a popular academic success. Here's Einstein in the elevator. There they have Snoopy and all that sort of stuff. Uh, uh, he, he goes on to say, well, I'll read you the opening paragraph. The great, well, maybe you should show the next slide just so that I can show you that it was in the International Herald Tribune also under the titles, The Colors of Physics. And they too thought this was a significant thing about the book. Uh, the great eggplant is what David Halliday and Robert Resnick, co-authors of physics, called our wildly successful textbook, a purple bound tome of 1,324 pages. <laughs> Boy, what a doorstop. Okay, S squeeze down to 817 pages in an alternative edition entitled Fundamentals of Physics and bound in orange, the text is called The Great Pumpkin. A planned revision to be bound in red has inevitably been dubbed the Big Apple. As sure as anything can be in the precarious publishing fields, the authors will never be caught with a lemon on their hands. He wrote that. Now what the writer didn't know and I can now reveal is just how these names started. It took years for the publisher to convince us that some abbreviated version of the text physics would be useful. And while we're arguing with them about what's wrong with it and how hard it would be to do it, of course, we were in our minds already formulating how to do it, a book that eventually gave, came to be called Fundamentals of Physics. Well, year after year passed and no manuscript materialized so that the physics editor Don Dedick said that he felt like Linus in the Charles Schultz Peanuts cartoon, waiting bravely and hopefully every year at Halloween for the great pumpkin to appear. And when the manuscript finally did appear, of course, it had to be orange, and we called it the Great Pumpkin. So in retrospect, the original purple opus had to be an eggplant. And so we were off to the vegetarian coloring game. And the first thing that Dave and I did in planning a book was to pick the color and the plant to which it was going to be referred. Uh, the revised edition of Fundamentals was a greenish yellow, and we call it the Big Banana. And when I hesitated about this choice and I told my editor that a lemon has the same color, he said, well, either way, you have a book with appeal. <laughs> he said it. Not every publishing barrier is so easily or luckily penetrated. An exam in modern physics that I cast in limerick form, <laughs> I'm now going to tie into the introduction here, the student has to fill either the couplet or the last line, and it has to make sense in physics. And it become part of the underground literature in physics instruction. Countless editors, it seemed, backed off from publishing it at the last minute. The exam is really about physics. I think it's even literary. But apparently, in the eyes of the reader, because of its form, it's too suggestive for them to take seriously. Uh, I gave them an example of one that was sociologically correct, but not correct in physics. And you all know there was a young girl named Bright whose speed was much faster than light. She eloped one day in a relative way and conceived on the previous night. <laughs> That's sociologically correct today, but doesn't fit relativity theory. Well, I thought, you know what a limerick is. A limerick packs laughs anatomical into space that's quite economical. But the good ones I've seen so seldom are clean, and the clean ones so seldom are comical, right? <laughs> or another version is, the limerick is furtive and mean. You must keep her in close quarantine, or she sneaks to the slums and promptly becomes disorderly, drunk, and obscene. Okay, here are some of the limericks. Let's have the first one. <laughs> 